This week on Africa Weekly. We meet the migrants willing to risk their lives by taking a perilous journey across the Mediterranean. Then to Somalia, where the banana industry is bouncing back after two decades of conflict decimated the country's economy. And we visit Abidjan Zoo, where the arrival of three new lions marks a turning point for one of West Africa's largest zoos. But first, a summary of the stories that made the headlines this week. Fourteen French soldiers are accused of sexually abusing children in the Central African Republic during a peacekeeping mission last year, after a leaked UN report said victims as young as eight were raped in exchange for food and money. French President François Hollande has vowed to show no mercy if they are found guilty. Nearly a week of clashes between police and protesters in Burundi has left at least seven people dead and 66 wounded after the ruling party designated President Pierre Nkurunziza as its candidate for the next presidential elections, which opposition figures argue is unconstitutional. In Togo, opposition leader Jean-Pierre Fabre claimed he won last weekend's presidential vote, despite the Electoral Commission pronouncing victory for incumbent Fok Nesingbe and the African Union saying the vote was free and transparent. Results of Sudan's presidential election were announced on Monday, securing another five-year term for President Omar al-Bashir, with more than 94% of the vote, extending his quarter century in power. And we end on a musical note. France marked UNESCO's International Jazz Day on Thursday, with a series of free performances across the capital over recent weeks. Tony Allen, one of the creators of Afrobeat, took the opportunity of his appearance to lament the migrant crisis in the Mediterranean with a song called Boat Journey. More than 1,750 migrants have died crossing the Mediterranean to Europe since the beginning of this year alone. But the shocking death toll isn't enough to stop Ferris el Bashawet, a Syrian man desperate to live in peace with his family. Every year, thousands of tourists flock to the port city of Alexandria in Egypt, popular for its beaches and rich history. But for some, it only serves as one big waiting room. Faris El Bashawat came here with his family to escape the conflict in Syria. Sitting in a small apartment, he shows his 10-year-old son Nimr pictures of the boy's mother and two of his sisters, enjoying a new life in Italy. They've already made the perilous journey across the Mediterranean. I left Syria with my daughters so Hezbollah and Bashar al-Assad's militia couldn't rape them, only to leave them here in Egypt. How could I do that? I would rather they die in the sea with honor. There are countless migrants willing to risk their lives at sea to find shelter in Europe. Abu Bara managed to secure seats for his wife and four children last year, but he had to resort to a little trick. He enlisted 10 other refugees who traveled on the same boat, each paying $2,200. I brought a specific number of refugees so I could send my children with them. I brought 10 of them because when you bring 10 people, you get to send one more for free. Human rights activists worry the situation would only get worse as the peak season for crossing approaches. Once the weather gets better starting in June, the numbers of migrants attempting to cross start to increase significantly and continue to do so until the end of September. We get more people every year, but this year we expect the numbers to increase even more. The UN Refugee Agency says more than 35,000 asylum seekers and migrants have reached southern Europe so far this year, like in this rescue mission in Sicily. But not all who attempt the trip make it to shore. On April 18th, at least 700 people drowned off the Libyan coast after their boat capsized in the Mediterranean Sea's worst migrant disaster to date. But the tragedy will not deter hundreds of others from taking their chances. On this plantation in Afgoye, less than an hour's drive outside Mogadishu, workers harvest the fruit of an industry on the bounce, bananas. The heavy bunches are carried to a waiting truck, which will transport them to the capital's port, and from there to destinations far and wide. 
Today we are exporting 12 containers of bananas to Iran following a contract we signed with an Iranian company. After more than two decades of conflict that decimated Somalia's economy, the banana industry is once again resurgent. With an improving security situation in the country, banana farmers are steadily scaling up production for both domestic and foreign buyers. Although the Growers Association estimates that less than a third of the 5,000 hectares previously in use remain active today. The Ministry of Agriculture has helped one of the export companies that has managed to export bananas for the first time in 25 years. Part of the industry's draw is the easy access to seaports from farms and the close proximity to Middle Eastern markets. And of course, it's also about taste. Since Italian colonists first brought bananas to Somalia in the 1920s, the fruit has become a major staple of the country's cuisine, often paired with rice or pasta. But in this Mogadishu market, sellers complain that the push to export bananas abroad is causing local prices to rise. Bananas used to be very cheap, but the price has now doubled. People don't like the increase in price, and you cannot persuade them to pay more. The export of bananas is causing us problems. Other challenges remain too, like rebuilding irrigation systems, roads and storage facilities, and ongoing security concerns. Still, many are betting that the time is ripe for Somalia to regain its crown as the leading East African banana exporter. After years without one of its main attractions, Ivory Coast's National Zoo of Abidjan is once more roaring into life. The delivery of three big cats from South Africa, two females and one male, is at last filling a void left after the zoo's previous feline residents died during the unrest following elections in November 2010. <laughs> The lions died before our eyes because we had nothing to feed them. They only eat meat. We didn't even know how to feed ourselves. More than 3,000 people died during Ivory Coast's post-political conflict and only a handful of the zoo's residents survived. And conflict hasn't been the only killer here. Around a dozen animals died from toxic waste poisoning and a number of monkeys were abandoned when owners feared they were carrying Ebola. Despite the challenges, the zoo's director is optimistic about its future. The National Zoo of Abidjan will become a zoo when all the international norms are in place. That means that all the animals in cages will be able to go into semi-natural areas, which are closed, but don't give the impression that a chimpanzee is in a prison. With zebras, giraffes and other cats soon to arrive, it's hoped the zoo will serve as a mini safari in the heart of Ivory Coast's economic capital. The first few visitors haven't been disappointed. I see lions all the time on TV, but I've never seen them in real life. I feel blessed. I'm really happy. As one of West Africa's largest zoos dating back to the 30s, there's also a cultural heritage to be preserved. The arrival of the three cats is a powerful symbol of the zoo's rebirth and a future built on pride. Somalia's Football Federation hopes to compete in the Africa Cup of Nations in 2019 and to have resolved ongoing issues with construction and threats to security posed by Shabab Islamists. Next week we'll find out how Ethiopia's eco-friendly coffee processing has caught the eyes of Italian buyers. And we go to Mali, where popular romance novels are challenging traditional notions of womanhood. Music